I told the last group, I didn't come to a funeral. <laughs> Y'all feel me on that? <laughs> yeah. So good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing, man? Great. It's a good day, man. It's really a good day, and I thank for the privilege and the honor to be able to come and to uh, serve God and be a voice for him. And I pray that the Spirit will invite me, because I don't want you to hear from me. I want you to hear from God, uh, because the main thing is that we need to hear from him more than ever. We need to hear from him. And so... Um, I only have 25 minutes. They handcuffed me, uh, trying to tame me. Uh, but we're going to do that. So uh, I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Amos, chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 21, and we're going to go to 27. Uh, at Bridge of Hope, when people are turning to uh, the pastor's scripture, I always ask them to say amen when they come to their pastor's scripture. So I'm going to ask you to do the same thing because I want us to be on the same page and be together, right? So uh, say amen when you come to that pastor's scripture. Amen. amen. There you go. We got a few more. Let's go. Uh, and y'all need to hurry up because you're biting into my time. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll just, just plan. <clears throat> I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Version. And uh, Amos 5, verse 21 and 27. I hate and despise your feast. Can't stand the stench of your solemn assemblies. Even if you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will have no regard for your fellowship offerings of fatted cattle. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. House of Israel, was it sacrifice and grain offerings that you presented to me during the 40 years of wilderness? But you have taken up Sekuth, your king, and Kawan, your star god, images you have made for yourself. So I will send unto, uh, into you, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus. The Lord, the God of armies, is his name, when he has spoken. I, I like that last part. The Lord, the God of armies, is his name, and he has spoken. Amos said, it's not me telling you this. This is what God is saying. When I look at this passage of Scripture, when I look at the book of Amos, and when I look at the chapters 1 and 2, I see what, what the, this repetitive aspect. He begins in chapter 1 and verse 3, the Lord says, chapter, I mean, verse 6, the Lord says, I mean, verse 9, the Lord says, verse 11, the Lord says, verse 13, the Lord says, chapter 2, verse 1, the Lord says, verse 4, the Lord says, verse 6, the Lord says. You getting the theme there? Chapter 3, starting at verse 1, listen to the message. Chapter 4, verse 1, listen to the message. Chapter 5, verse 1, listen to the message. Here's the question that I have for people. What voice and what message are we listening to? Why is there division in the body of Christ over a political issue? Why is it hard for people to understand justice and righteousness? Why is it hard for people of the body of Christ to love one another? Why is it that I see on Facebook that we are divided and we are saying things such as you can't be a Christian if you vote for this person or that person? What is the problem with the body of Christ? Are we taking our cues from the culture? Because if we're taking our cues from God, these things will not be said. We then will be able to look at one another as image bearers and not look at the distinctions and look at them as being superior or inferior. We would begin to look at one another through the spiritual lenses of equality, of dignity, of integrity, of people with purpose and people who have value. See, the world can't see that. I don't expect them to, but I expect the church to. If we say that we're saved. So in the book of Amos, just looking at the context of Amos, in chapter 5, verse 13, he, he makes this statement. He says, therefore, those who have insight will keep silent at such a time for the days are evil. We're living in evil days. Israel have become a heathen to the Lord. 
it begins to act like a pagan nation. Uh, United States is beginning to act like a pagan nation and then not as a nation that has churches in the body of Christ who are able to stand firm on truth and not feelings and emotions. No sin committed by Israel had escaped the all seeing and all-knowing God, neither would he turn a blind eye to ours. For I know your transgressions. There are many. Your sins are great. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful nation, on the sinful kingdom. That's Amos 9. We cannot hide our sins from the omniscient God of all creation. Can't. He sees everything. David said it himself, wherever I go, you are there. One of the things I was sharing with, with Steve uh, uh, yesterday, I said, the challenge for us, we do pretty decent publicly as Christians, don't we? We put our mask on. But when we're by ourselves, there becomes the challenge. Because we think we are by ourselves and we forgot that the God of all creation is right there watching us. Israel was ungrateful. Why were they ungrateful? They forgot where God has brought them from. God told them, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Did he not bring you out of your Egypt? Did he bring, not bring you out of your despair? Did he not bring you out of your depression, out of your dissensions and your, your desertion? Have, have God not brought you out of darkness and brought you into the light of his kingdom? Then if that is true, we need to be, we know the truth because he is light of the truth. We're supposed to expose the, the, the evil and the lies. That's why he says in the book of Ephesians, to wake up. We've been sleeping. They have disgraced the poor. Man, they did an injustice toward the poor. They even took bribes to keep the poor in check so they can make more money off the poor. You know, if you really understand poverty, you realize there's institutions and systems that are set up to keep people poor. And people make money off of them. But that's the system I expect that of the world. I do not expect that of the church. Not my brothers and sisters. We can see that the same behavior, that, that, that one of the things that, that they, are, they had an appetite for was riches, because that's one of the problems here. You know one of the major problems of the hindrance of, 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 of the body of Christ, of an individual to really submit to God? That's human prosperity. Even the, even the rich young ruler came up to, up to Jesus. Come to find out, he desired his riches more than following Christ. In this context here, they got so comfortable and so complacent and so happy they had all these things that they drifted away from God. And you see, I, I share with you, they, they made their own gods and created their own king. Daniel says this. Daniel says in chapter 2, I think verse 21, he says this. He said, God is the one that put kings in positions and he's the one that removes them. So whoever... God puts in this position as president of this country, he has, the, he has the, the ability to take him out. But here's the thing we forget about, the providence of God. He still sits on the throne. Maybe I'm reading the wrong Bible or something. I don't, I don't know because he says in the book of Revelation, he's the king of kings, Lord of lords. He even helped us to realize and understand in Matthew 6 this model prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. We have turned from his kingdom to a kingdom in America. Israel had gone into a self-imposed spiritual delusion. They were delusional. They thought that the way that they were living, that God would look beyond that as long as they came and brought their grain offering and their fellowship offering and their burnt offerings. And all these offerings are contingent with a positive and holy relationship with God. When you sever your relationship with God, God is not accepting your worship. 
Y'all need to hear me on this, dog. I'm just telling you, worship is not about Sunday morning. Worship is about living a lifestyle that glorifies your God each and every day. And the reason why God is not accepting their worship because there was an absence of obedience. When there's an absence of obedience, that means there's an absence of love. Love is the motivation for us to serve. Without the great commandment, there is no great commission. If we do not love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, there's no way possible I can love my brother or love my neighbor as I love myself. In 1 John first, uh, uh, chapter 4, he talks about this same vernacular. He tells us this. He said, how in the world can you say you love me when you hate your brother? Do you know your brother and your sisters have distinctions? I love these two right here. Don't know their name, but love them. I came up. Why? Oh, love my little sister right there. God bless her heart. Why? It, it appears to me every church that I go to, like these, these front rows are reserved for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but they were sitting there. And the reason why they said it said, we want to be up front based on the fact that at least I didn't get that from you because I didn't talk to you long enough. But I got that from them because they want to be up front. They want to hear what the word of God says. They don't want any distractions. We have allowed distractions to interfere with our relationship with God. And so as we look at this, man, I want to talk about true worship right quickly. True worship is, is something that you bow down to. You bow down to and you submit to. So true worship is this. True worship is the eternal action of an eternal attitude. That means our mind must be there. Whoever has your mind in your heart, because that's synonymous in the Bible, whoever has your mind in the heart has you. If God doesn't have your mind and heart, he don't have you. The Bible teaches us to captivate every thought for the sake of Christ. That's what he says. So I want to get to this point. There's four points I want to share with you. I think I'm, the Lord is blessing me. I only did 11 minutes. I got 14 more. Four points. And don't be shaking your head at everybody, Steve. <laughs> the first point, looking at verses 21 and 22, God has the animosity toward religious worship. You know that? This is what he says. This is strong language. I hate, I despise your feast. Can't stand the stench of your solemn assemblies, it stinks. He can't stand it. True worship is an aroma that comes up to God that is pleasing to his nose. Here he's saying, I can't stand it. He hates it. That's why I use the word animosity toward the religious worship, because it's man-made, it's not God-led, it's not spirit-led, it's not truth-led. And it's all external. We, 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 we go out and we have this facade as though we're holy and righteous. But in reality, we're prejudiced, we're bigotry, we don't do justice, we talk about people, we, th we look out for ourselves. That's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is inclusive, is it not? We're supposed to, we're supposed to love everybody. But the problem is, is that we put on this appearance. If you look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, you will see the evidence of that in chapter 5 verses, uh, chapter 3 verses 1 through 5. He said it takes the form. Religion is a form of holiness, but it has no substance. Because the heart is not there. It's traditional because it's humanistic. I want you to understand when Jesus told the woman at the well that y'all worship in the mountain and, 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 and that we worship here, he's saying this. What you, he said, y'all don't know what y'all was worshiping. So in other words, what you were doing traditionally, it don't count. Too many times we worship traditionally by a human perspective. It don't count because it's not led by the spirit and by truth. True worship, true worship is spirit and truth. 
and it's occupational. Why is, why is, is, is a man-made religion occupational? Because we're trying to work for God's satisfaction. We try, you know, it, what bothers me, and it, it makes no enemy times that I sit down, I talk with people, and I take my time to help them to understand the gospel, that Jesus died for all your sins. You don't have to work for it. You, you automatically, by faith, you go into the, to heaven. And they said, yeah, man, but I got to work. I got to go work to get into heaven. I said, will you just shut up? It bothers me that people believe that they have to live in a way that they have to work to get in. No, it's about your love for God. It's about your acceptance for a Savior and a Lord. It's about you believing in Jesus Christ. It's about the gospel. We're going to get to that here pretty soon. The second one I want to talk about is God's attitude toward religious worship. We already did about the hatred. He don't like it. So what is his mindset toward it? He rejects the songs, verse 23. He said, take away from me the noise of your song. You may think you sound good, but to God, it's noise. Why is it noise? It's the absence of, of obedience. It has no regard. He has no regard for the sounds of your music. I mean, he don't value it at all because it really has no substance or purpose. Because it's all about you and it's not about me. He is repugnant toward the service. It disgusts him of how we live and how they are living their lives. I believe he's disgusted about how we are living our lives right now. The thing about worship is it's about obedience. It's about love. It's about, it's about how I care about God and how I care about people. When I drive down the street, I see homeless people, man. I see homeless people a lot, dog. And they're walking in a way that they have no destination. They walk slow. They're looking around. Jesus came into Jerusalem, and the Bible said that he had compassion. I mean, he, his heart hurt because he's seeing the people in Jerusalem like sheep without a shepherd because they were downcast and they were downtrodden. They were discouraged. How can we be the light of the world when we're walking in the darkness of the culture? When we have submitted to a political authority and not to the spiritual one. It bothers me. It breaks my heart. God hates it, and he will not accept our worship. You can come to church all you want. It's fine. Hopefully you may hear something that can change you. But if you come in here thinking that God's going to be pleased with it, when you leave out of here and you go back out and live the same old way Monday through Saturday, serving your gods, then that's a problem. When you get back on Facebook and you begin to chime in about the political aspect and condemning people about their choices, that's the problem. When we get to the point to where we think that there is no racism in this world as though uh, everything is a kumbaya moment, you, you are truly lost. This is why he comes to my third point in verse 24. He says this, but let justice, what, flow like the river and righteousness like an unfailing stream. As a, you know, I love talking to, to Steve. We get a chance to, we get a chance to talk to one another. Preachers, God used preachers to talk to one another to enlighten us. We get the chance to hear things. And so one of the things that is that I, thought I was sharing with him, I said, you know, that's the gospel. Verse 24 is the gospel. Understand this. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Paul says this to the, to the Roman church. It is the gospel that has the power of salvation. Oh, excuse me, not baptism. Oh. It's the gospel that has the power of salvation. Because the gospel... It's about Jesus. Acts 4 said there is no other name in which man can be saved. So it's based on what Jesus did, based on what the Father, the love that he had for us, and he gave his son only begotten. Talks about the value of the gift. 
that he loves us so much and values us so much that he gave us his son, that his son, when he was on that tree, somebody who listened to me real good, and the sky went black for three hours. That means all the sins of the world was coming upon our Savior. And those of us believe that, that he died, shed his blood, which was the payment for our sins, and went to the grave. And the Bible says that he rose again, which is the receipt of the payment. Somebody need to hear me. Amen. That we're saved. Huh? Now, understand this. God imputed the sins upon him, but he imputed the righteousness in us. In the Greek, righteousness and justice is the same Greek word. It's synonymous. So that means if I'm right with God, I'm right with Steve. And if I'm right with Steve, I'm going to treat him just, just and fairly. So the impact of righteousness is how I treat you. It's equality. I treat you fairly. That means I don't oppress you. I don't persecute you. I come alongside and I'm going to help you. It's that golden rule that, that, that we, we look in the Bible. What's the golden rule? Somebody hear me. Help me real quick because my time's running. What's the golden rule? There it is, Doc. You want justice done for you? Do it for your brother. Do it for your sister. It bothers me that the church has a problem when it comes to skin color. When we know the truth that we're all image bearers, that we are all born and created in the image of our creator, which basically means, oh, besides, we're diverse too, right? Male and female. Somebody need to hear me on that. And the aspect of this, we all have purpose, we all have value, we all have dignity, and we all have worth. Why is it so hard for us to talk to one another? Who are we listening to? What history are we accepting? The last thing. Well, not the last thing. Man, my time is shot like it. What is God's, God's accepting of relational worship? Check this out. Listen to this. Here you go. It's the gospel. God is going to accept nothing else but the gospel, okay? How we act, how we live. That's when justice is going to flow. That's when righteousness is going to do its thing. But the last part, what is God's action toward religious worship? Here's his action. It's discipline. God disciplined those that he loves. Hebrews 12 deals with that, right? A father disciplines his son. And the purpose of discipline is to do what? It's to bring you back in. That's the word restoration. Restoration means basically to bring you back into your original context, right? God wants to bring us back into the original context of that intimacy that we had. He don't want us to be religious zealots. He doesn't want us to be doctrinally sound without having love for him. You can know the Bible and hate people in God. Book of Ephesus, I mean the, the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation, they were doctrinally sound, but yet they lost their first love. They became religious and mechanical in what they did because they stopped pursuing the relationship and the intimacy of God. When you do that, man, you continue the relationship with one another. When we stop loving God, we stop loving each other. Come on, man. So listen, let me just share this and leave this with you guys. Pursue the passion that you had at the beginning for Christ. Love him with all your heart. How many of y'all married right quick? Got two minutes. Okay, when you get married, do you stop pursuing the intimacy of your spouse? If you do, we need to sit down and counsel. <laughs> because your marriage is supposed to be a lifelong dating process. It's supposed to be this thing that we always create that intimacy to become closer, not stagnant and not far apart. We cannot allow 
what's happening today to interfere with that relationship. God has allowed this to happen to wake us up. I believe this is a watershed moment for the church. It's a divining moment for the body of Christ to wake up out of his slumber. So I pray that what God has said to me, through me, may enlighten you as it has enlightened me that we can now see one another through the lenses of God's eyes and not through the eyes of the flesh. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.